So today we've got three speakers. We've got Tina, uh, myself and Catherine. And uh, this conference is called uh, Powering Up to Take on Energy. So that's what we're going to be discussing. Uh, if you want to ask questions, you can put them in the chat. What we'll do, uh, Tina will speak first and then we'll have a few minutes if you want to ask questions for Tina. Then I'll speak few minutes if you want to ask questions for me, then Catherine, and then a bit of time for questions at the end if people want to do that. Um, so without further ado, uh, shall we kick it off? Uh, Tina, over to you. Hi. So this morning when I was asked to speak today, um, it was on what subject that I, I got to choose the subject, which was really exciting because I have spent a decade talking about fracking. And I can't tell you how much I despise that word. And if I never had to say it again, I'd be very, very happy. Um, fortunately, we're currently in a state where we have a moratorium on it. So no, it's not a win, but we did murder the industry financially, which was part of the aim. So I think we could well be onto a winner there. And apart from anything else, although we haven't stopped it completely and it doesn't cover all forms of um, unconventional energy extraction, what we have succeeded in doing is taking out one, one of those types. So I think we need to rejoice more. I know that when we got the moratorium, a lot of people complained that because it wasn't a ban, it wasn't a real win. But, you know, we're so quick to beat ourselves with sticks and so rare do we actually bring out the pom-poms to go, hey, you know what, we did this. We did this diligently for 10 years and we didn't stop until we got them to stop. So I think that the anti-fracking movement across this country has been amazing. And there's absolutely no denying that the reason for that was the stubborn diligence of women, I would say. You know, when we first started doing the public meetings to alert areas to the fact that there was a fracking license in their area, we do the public meeting and I'd look out of the room and the low hanging fruit was the women, you know? They would engage with you very quickly. They got it because the things we were addressing was the chemicals used in fracking that affected um, your instance of breast cancer, affected your fertility, your ability to carry a baby full term, that the um, Utah midwives had more baby graves than they'd ever had. It was tragic, it was awful, and it hit women first physically. So because of that, I think we managed to engage a lot of women. And what I hadn't realized ever in my life, the impact of bringing together a group of women who once you gave them the truth, would not let go of that because it was a threat to their kids. And watching that in action is what I watched for the last decade. But in doing that, I think we came to it to protest very differently. So not looking at the fracking aspect now, we look at how do we do protest. And right now we have Black Lives Matters. We can see how the media is portraying that. We can see the spin. We can see how they only zoom in on the violence of the people they wish to degrade. And that we can see that everything is manipulated in media. So the only way to get around that, I, I found for us particularly, um, and it kind of came naturally, was to do a lot of knitting, a lot of tea drinking, a lot of looking very sweet, a lot of playing on your own weaknesses. And if you were slow, be slow, that slowed down trucks. If you were small like me, you'd nip under police lines, duck and dive. There was lots of things you could use to your advantage you never imagined you could. And that the less like a great big scary activist you were, the more likely people would engage. Because when you're asking people to come and stand alongside you to campaign or to protest, you can't make it the ugliest, most brutal thing they've ever done. And it does become ugly and it does become brutal. And I've spent time in courtrooms and jail cells and I've been damaged by police. And I get all that needs to be spoken about. But I don't want to speak about it as the most important thing because then I would lose getting anyone in this fight. And it sounds cruel, but we kind of pied piper people in. You know, we, we made the tea, we provided the cake, we put the music on and we danced. And women came. And the fact that they came and they danced in the driveway of a fracking site was very useful because then they couldn't get the trucks in. But if instead I had been complaining, and also that was another thing, Lancashire police tried very hard to make the fight about protest and act, uh, police. And if that had been the focus, then much like Black Lives Matter, we're talking about 
the functionality of that protest rather than the reason for the protest. And I think that's the thing is to stay focused. And, and in staying focused, like say for instance, with again with fracking, we said, do you agree that this needs to stop? And whatever else you agreed with, whether you were a conservative, labor, whatever you were, whatever your other beliefs were, to put all of those things aside and decide one thing together that you can agree on and not have those big discussions about the things you don't. Because then that's when you tear yourselves apart. So while we stood shoulder to shoulder, even if I didn't agree with all of your other ethics and morals and policies, didn't matter. You were standing next to me shoulder to shoulder on this one thing. And that was really important. And I think the, the other thing that's important is to, when I first came into activism, I was constantly being told by, you know, experienced activists, which I suppose is where I am now, what I should and shouldn't do. And that this was the right thing and that was the wrong thing. And in the end, I think I never found the type of activist I wanted to be amongst the types that already existed. So we just created it ourselves. And that was amazing. You know, we were doing media in the early days and it was saying um you know eco warriors climate campaigners and i thought you know i'm none of those things i'm a really scared grandma and i'm scared for my granddaughter's future and that's the only reason i'm here so that was when we ended up calling ourselves nanas um and then all of a sudden i'm on the news and it says tina rothery nana and instead of like looking away from the telly and thinking well that's not me People are like, what, why is there a nana on the television? You know, why, why, why would that be? It was a human connection. And again, it's like even when you look at these sorts of things that we do now, being the human that you are, not overly, not trying to impress with your professionalism, your skills and your expertise, just being real and true and honest, you know? There were, um, if I could just share one of the things that made it particularly strong in portraying ourselves as soft women, was that we had um, three knitting circles in front of the gates. And each little circle was six to eight women in, in three little sets. And we were just knitting, just knitting. And the police thought it was nothing, it was not important. Just a bunch of women knitting. When the trucks come, we'll just move them out of the way, it'll be no bother. So we had a good hours knitting before we actually had the trucks try to come in. So, but what the police hadn't noticed was that we were all wearing woolly handcuffs and that all our woolly handcuffs were lightly woven into the wool together and that that wool was then lightly woven into the chairs and between us into the knitting basket so that as we continued to knit we became a ball of wool essentially <laughs> that was very hard to break up so when the police came in and said right time to separate let's get you all apart and they started to try and pull us apart they realized we'd actually woven ourselves together and there was not really going to be as easy as they thought. And uh, one of the policemen said to me, he said, oh, Tina, he said, this could be conceived as almost a lock on. And I looked at him and I was like, you did see the event on Facebook. We called it a yarn on. I don't think it could have been any more obvious what we were going to do. But what was really interesting was at the time that the women were knitting, the stronger activists, maybe a lot of the young male activists, came to our aid and it was really sweet of them to come to our aid but we didn't want the aid i wanted to look small i wanted to show how far are these police willing to go for the sake of this industry on a bunch of knitting grandmas i mean that's just an affront if you see a policeman tearing into a young guy with raster hair or you know or something then you're going to then they perceive that as it's a fair fight but when you can put a bunch of people together who it doesn't look a fair fight with. And we've never had a decent Daily Mail heading in our lives, obviously, the Daily Mail being what it is. But as they tore me away from my chair, I started wrapping the wool around my neck. I have no idea why. It was a really stupid move because the lady next to me moved her chair and nearly killed me. And, uh, but as the police got it, they were cutting all the wool away and they lifted my chair with me on it and dragged me off. And then they threw my head back and used a knife to cut the wall. Now, this was of no danger to me and it wasn't scary, but oh my God, and that Daily Mail image and headline it was, because it said, 50 Lancashire cops bear down on 18 knitting OAPs. Beautiful. It was everything we wanted. 
And it was totally, I think you have to be unexpected in protest. It can't just be angriness. You must find ways and also to make it inclusive because there are an awful lot of people who go, I can't be an activist like you because. And if you take that because and you make it your reason to be, you know, Anne Power is what, 83, 84 years old. I, and most women like in her with a walking stick and she would normally be the sort of person you'd expect to say, I can't be because I'm not able bodied. But her lack of speed meant that when she walked in front of a truck, no one was going to move her because she was an older lady. I mean, they did at some point, they dragged her across the road, not lifting her feet and they dragged her heels all the way across the cops. But she used that and she, she, she used it and we used the images and we made sure that people understood that there was this abuse of everyday residents by the police and by the state and showed that up, but never became them. You know, if the number of times I say this and I'm the worst for it, um, I started live streaming everything because we needed the evidence and also because I felt like we needed to have a perspective that wasn't just shouty anger and not just focusing on the angry bits and trying not to swear so that I could share it with my nieces. But as it was, I ended up being probably amongst the worst for the swearingness and I try not to be, but you try to retain your temper in a protest, but it's very difficult, but you do need to. We went down as en masse, a hundred women to London and uh, we went down dressed as suffragettes and we went down to go to Parliament Square to make a point and then to go across to the um, business offices to uh, make a stand there. I think it's BEIS now, but it was whatever it was before. And when we did that, there were a lot of other activists in London at the time with angry signs and angry faces. And we did what we always do, which is sign up, smile on and wave. And people engage, you know, that's you step into activism. If the guy on the, in the car beeps back, that may be the first time he's ever supported activism, you know, and I think it was really important to do that. So over the years, we've done all sorts of different things. And I would recommend that, you know, we talk about protesting and campaigning. And sadly, what my start as a campaign will inevitably turn into a protest when the government doesn't heed what is being asked. Um, but you do need to keep it light, keep it fun, because if you're going to be at this for a very long time, you need to go into it knowing that it's not going to be miserable and horrible. I mean, we live for Wednesdays. Every Wednesday, the women had a 15 minute silence at the gates. And don't forget, this went on for three years. So that was a lot of silences. So you can't just stand there in silence for 15 minutes. So we built a four hour repertoire around it which included dances that we taught ourselves. We taught ourselves to play samba band. We taught ourselves all sorts of things that would keep us busy and fun and active and united. And it was strange with that 15 minute silence because although it was unifying for the women who took part because it was Women's Wednesdays, there was also the bonding or the awareness of a shared sense of time and experience for the police, for the security guards, for the other activists and for onlookers who weren't maybe part of that silence, but everybody would fall silent. And I remember on the second one we did, um, someone started doing a hedge cutting behind me. And one of the police broke the line, shot across and said, shh, it's the silence. And I was like, oh my God, how weird is that? And the same way that the security guards, had I been on the opposite team, I'd have blasted a radio. I'd have been a real demon about it, you know, because they didn't have to abide, but they did. They all fell silent, you know, to try and get some respect for the human that you are rather than anger for the activist that you are is I think what you've got to strive to achieve and the easiest thing to do because just being you, not being what you perceive as an activist, you know, and, and we were really blessed too. We were lucky to have, you know, in the beginning, we got um, Vivian Westwood came on board and the Nanas went on a tank with her to declare war on fracking at David Cameron's house, which was really a hoot anyway. Um, and I remember getting slandered by other activists who were more determined, going, you guys, just celebrities, it's a fluff piece. But it wasn't because here's what happened that night. That night on Twitter, I read Nylon magazine um, had an article in there and they all loved Vivian Westwood. So there were fans of Vivian Westwood in Japan for this magazine. And everyone was suddenly reading about fracking when normally they were reading about Vivian and Nylon. And then I went on a five day tour with her and others on this tour bus to cities across the UK. 
And Vivian was really sensible. She only ever went on at the end because she knew people had come to see her. So she'd let us all do our talking about the fracking. Then she'd do her end bit. They're very useful and very kind and, and not to write anyone off. Emma Thompson took a field with us at, and her sister Sophie and my sister Julie. So we all took this field where there was going to be fracking at five or six in the morning with Greenpeace. And then we created a Bake Off, the Great British Bake Off in a field with uh, recycled cakes about wind farms and solar. And we got sprayed by manure, by the farmer, but they were such good sports. And again, the stuff that goes wrong even gave us good leverage. So I, I would just say that I think I know a lot of people who are scared of the word activist and protest. And I would just attest, along with the 90 other women that I fondly call nanas, that none of us has ever done anything we weren't brave and we didn't feel we could do. I never felt I had to. And everything we did was a pure delight to us. And although the outcomes were sometimes painful or involved legal consequences, everything was on my terms because I think you stand as an autonomous activist alongside people who are just like you doing the same thing, you know, but you don't have to agree to all the terms. So that's sort of it in a nutshell, really, um, about how it worked for us. And I would just want to encourage, particularly, I, I suppose it is particularly women, because I'm just going to give you one last example, which is Mary Doig. Um, she's a woman in her late 70s, um, fairly isolated in a community. Her husband died some time ago. She lived in this community because that was where his family and people were. But everyone she knew had gone. And she'd been fairly silent in the community, I think. And she came to find us and see what was going on and got a little bit bossy about the way we were presenting the cakes and the knitting and that we weren't knitting right and that she would teach us to knit. Anyway, so Mary Doy bossily took over the knitting, taught every one of us to knit properly and produced the most amazing things called Nana Magic Blankets that we'd then give to other people who were staying on camps or, you know, just people we felt could benefit from these lovely blankets. And we got women across the world to knit pieces of wool that we could then turn into these blankets. Ideas that I would never have had, and that I can't think of many other activist groups that would have had, but just, be, and Mary now is a huge part of our world. So I think that, I always remember thinking that even if it all failed, the ultimate goal fails, or you haven't reached it yet, you have to find the things you got right along the way and say, yay. You know, every day we won, every day that Mary Doy wasn't at home and she was with us, enriching us with her knowledge and company, to me was a win. You know, there are lots of wins beside your ultimate goal. And I think you, you find those along the way. Yeah, it's been a heck of a journey. Um, I have a, a, a three and a half minute film, but I don't think there's time for it now. But if you want to, we can sort of put that on at the end. But it really does show, and I, I just like it because it shows all the faces of these people who are so like us, they're just everyday folk who did some pretty damned amazing things for the last 10 years. That's me. <laughs> well, thanks, Tina, that was amazing. Um, okay, uh, I couldn't see any questions in the chat, but if anyone's got a few questions, we'll do a few questions now if you've got anything burning to say or else we'll crack on. What alternative should Greens argue for as an alternative to fracking? There's two ways of answering that question. One is my natural question, which is really rude and just says, it's my job to stop the gun. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm there to stop the gun, not tell you which alternative to use. So as far as I'm concerned, this is so bad and so dangerous for each individual and the planet, regardless of whatever else there is, you don't choose this option. It should never have been on the table. The alternatives are numerous. I worked with Gina Dowding when she was MEP and with Catherine Rowett and, um, some of the amazing stuff that we produce with regard to um, the Green New Deal for the Northwest. I've read the Build Back Better. There is so much that we can do. And there's a film coming out of Australia that's worth looking at. I think it's called 2040. And what they did was these clever minds and scientists and academics checked everything, every resource we have available to us now. Could we stop fossil fuel use instantly? And what would happen to us if we did? And it works out that they've actually got everything we need if we just utilize it correctly. And again, I went on a tour in Northern Ireland. We did um, some, some, we were going to different councils to try and get them to divest. 
And what they did there was they did an assessment of um, what would happen if you took all of the money that was invested by councils in fossil fuels and you removed the fossil fuel aspect but didn't add anything else in? Where would you be at that point? And at that point, you were actually better off because there's less risk and there was no suffering with regard with regards to how those investments were working. I mean, I'm not sure how it would be now because the world's an economic mess. But certainly at the time, you know, we're told, oh, you can't live without fossil fuels and you can't divest from them. But you really can. And there are plenty of experts who will tell you we can. And those who are telling you we can't are invested in the industry in some way.